Hello, everyone, and welcome um, to today's uh, Two and Through um, Research Spotlight. So just a few words, uh, the Two and Through Project, um, we um, host these spotlight sessions just to bring some light to really, really great practice, data, and research efforts happening in Chicago and around the country. Um, Two and Through Project, we aim to significantly increase high school and post-secondary completion for under-resourced students of color in Chicago and around the country by providing education stakeholders with research-based data on students' educational experiences and facilitating dialogue on its implications for adult practice. And um, I think we're doing both of those things today. Um, so just a quick uh, introduction of John and Jeanette, and then I'm going to leave it to them. Uh, John Easton is a senior fellow at the UChicago Consortium on School Research. Um, prior to that, he served as Vice President of Programs at the Spencer Foundation. At Spencer, he developed and led a new grant program for research practice partnerships. Between 2009 and 2014, John was in D.C., where he was the director of the Institute of Education Sciences at the USDOE. Um, and prior to his government service, John was the uh, executive director of the UChicago Consortium, um, where he co-authored some seminal research on uh, school organizations, what has become the five essentials, um, and uh, the early warning indicator freshman on track. Jeanette Porter is the director of research and the senior fellow or senior fellow at the Student Experience Research Network, um, which uh, is the formerly the Mindset Scholars Network. Uh, prior to joining um, CERN, uh, Jeanette was a senior researcher at the Chicago Consortium, um, and her um, research uh, centered around addressing issues related to uh, practice measurement, effective data use, and policy implementation processes. Um, Jeanette was part of a team um, with Camille Farrington and uh, uh, Camille's group that worked on uh, social emotional learning and uh, equitable school environments. Um, and so with that, I am super excited to turn it over to John and Jeanette. Uh, one, sorry, one note before I go, one more thing. Um, if you have questions uh, that you would like uh, while John and Jeanette are presenting, please put them, use the Q&A function. Um, and uh, John and Jeanette will either answer them if they're super technical during the presentation, um, but um, I'll come back on towards the end and uh, facilitate a conversation with John and Jeanette where we'll get to all of your questions. So I'll be kind of monitoring those questions during their presentation. All right, now I'm really stepping aside. John and Jeanette, uh, it's, it's all you. John, you are on mute still. I, uh, I was on mute and I'm unmuted. Thanks so much, Alex, for the nice introduction, uh, saying generous things about both of us. I wanna start off with a little background on this study because it's kind of a, a complex team of researchers from three different institutions who have uh, found themselves into a very complementary uh, partnership. This work began at the consortium uh, while Jeanette was there. And as a social psychologist, Jeanette's always been very interested in social emotional development and also about its, uh, its measurement uh, and with questions about how to measure these factors in kids. You know, in students. Um, she teamed up with Karabu Jackson, who's an economist at Northwestern University. And among many of his great research, uh, he studied um, how teachers have differential effects on students' uh, test score improvement versus their behavioral improvement uh, versus what kind of soft skills as reflected in grades and attendance. And so the two of them uh, teamed up, uh, wrote some proposals to, to look at how these factors work out in schools. Can we measure these social emotional factors? Um, and do we see that whether or not schools have effects on them? Next slide, please. Oh, let me, I wanna mention the other folks, I'm sorry. Um, we were joined by uh, uh, two great young people. Uh, Sebastian Kegel at Northwestern worked with Bo on a lot of the statistical analysis. And Alyssa Blanchard at the consortium spent 
about an entire year putting together our data sets and creating data dictionaries and uh, doing an enormous uh, amount of helpful work for this group. Um, so I want to just back off a little and say the, the research is really motivated by a number of important questions. Um, one of them was, uh, are students um, self-reports of their feelings, their behaviors, uh, their beliefs? Uh, are they reliable? And uh, I guess more importantly, uh, an old word, uh, veridical, that is, do they correspond to reality? And both of these topics have been very controversial. There's a lot of not, not a definitive evidence on either the reliability or the validity question. So this was quite important to us about just the measurement itself. But that was complemented by a question about, we're looking at students as they move from eighth to ninth grade, and are these factors actually malleable? Can, can students change at that point of time? Uh, our work on uh, the on track suggests that yes, they can, but we're wondering also, can the social emotional development uh, trajectories be altered by school experience? And so finally, wrapping these to get to, together is um, how much of a role does the school itself play in students' social de emotional development? So the way we're gonna proceed is we got five uh, points to cover. Uh, one is measuring school effectiveness, and I'm gonna talk about that. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Shanette for, to talk about uh, how they effective schools matter for student success. Uh, what kind of students benefit from uh, effective schools? Is it a story of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, or do we have uh, anything more encouraging to learn? And then finally, what differentiates um, effective schools from less effective uh, schools? So I just wanna key off with, we're um, studying Chicago public high schools. We have all traditional public schools and charter schools between the years of 2011 and 2017. Uh, and we have an N of over 150,000 students. It's enormous uh, amount of information um, that took a long time to compile and it's extremely uh, and unusually comprehensive. Uh, so next, um, so what we're doing here is we're using value add techniques uh, in a number of different areas. And I think most of you are familiar with the idea of value add test scores, where we look to see if uh, a teacher or a school adds value to a student's learning. And we do that by asking, to, does one student in one context learn more or less than a student with the same background characteristics, the same demographics, the same prior test scores in another school? So if a student in my school does better than students like him or her in other schools, we have a positive value add. So that's been widely applied to test scores, it's used in Chicago Public Schools accountability, it's used in teacher evaluation. Well, we applied exactly the same techniques in three other areas. Uh, one we call social well-being, another work hard, and the final and fourth one on um, uh, behaviors. And I just want to say a little bit more about uh, you probably have an idea what social well-being means, but we use two specific measures from the 5E survey. These are not part of the accountability. They're actually not part of the 5E, but they're on the sur survey. Um, and one is called emotional health. That was a measure that the consortium created at the request of the Chicago Public Schools. And I just want to give you a feeling for you know, you may have in your mind what emotional health is, but this is answers, students answers to questions about, I can always find a way to help people end arguments. I listen carefully to what other people say to me. I'm good at working with other students. I'm good at working with other people. So this really is really getting about interpersonal skills. In our work hard, we have three different 
survey measures. And uh, this one that we call engagement is about study, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's study habits, it's about studying for tests, setting time aside to do homework and study, trying to do well on work that's not interesting, and staying home and, and studying instead of going out with friends. So uh, we call these things study habit under the category of work hard, but there's a little bit of executive function in there. You'll find lots of other um, psychological constructs here. But so what we're asking is, does this student in this school grow more or less than students like that in another school? And we build it up to the school measure. Um, and the four of these we combine. Uh, we're not gonna make a big deal of this, but when we use a statistical pre procedure called principal component analysis, it weights the two survey um, measures higher. It shows that the social well-being and work hard are more important for the outcomes that Shanette's gonna explain to you in just a minute. Okay, I have one last slide. You know, um, this is kind of repetitive. So we're calling it a, an effective school, a school that scores uh, one standard deviation above the average in uh, fostering growth on this composite measure that we call uh, school effectiveness. Um, so I wanna show what we've done here is we've taken our school effectiveness indicator and divided it into thirds. The bottom third, the middle third, and the top third. And our effectiveness indicator behaves very different from most school quality indicators that you look at. I'm gonna take you across that top row where we're looking at the percent of kids with free and reduced lunch, going from the least effective to the average effective to the most effective. And I hope you can see this, but those numbers hardly change. So they're very similar in terms of the distribution of kids who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Now, if I did this with SQUIRP and divided it into levels, you would see the higher SQUIRP ratings have, have more affluent kids in it. And let's look at the Latinx population uh, finally. And uh, we see again, the top, middle, and bottom thirds have almost exactly identical uh, per percentages of Latinx kids in them. So what this uh, we show later, Shanette has a slide on this, but this is a big point and it's really important to get, is that our measure of school effectiveness is unrelated to student demographics, their race, their gender, their free lunch status, their um, EL status, their special education status, and their incoming test scores. So this is, this is a, not a way you're used to thinking of school effectiveness. So this is telling us that yes, there are schools on the far south side that may look low performing to what the kind of things that we normally see about them but they may be improving uh, kids' uh, social emotional development, test score development and behavior. So when we look at the schools, according to effectiveness, um, we see about half of um, high schools on the top end above the median uh, are serving pr primarily black students as those below the median, the same as about uh, Latinx. And this bullet says 50% of selective enrollment schools above the median on school effectiveness. But a more fine detail is those thirds that I showed you. At the time of our study, there were nine selective enrollment high schools. There were three in our bottom group, three in our middle group, and three in our top group. So again, I wanna emphasize this is a new way of thinking about school effectiveness. And now Shanette's gonna tell you the, the fun stuff. Thanks, John. And just want to reiterate some of the things John said in the beginning there. Thanks so much for having us and for inviting us. 
Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what your questions are. So first I'm going to talk about the average long run impacts of attending an effective school. And again, like John said, that's a school that's one standard deviation above the median of school effectiveness. So in short, more effective schools have positive impacts on educational attainment and interaction with the legal system. And these graphs are an illustration of the long run impacts of attending an effective high school in ninth grade, again, relative to a median or average school. In all cases on these graphs, the y axis is given in percentages uh, and the x axis is school effectiveness, also in standard deviations, don't need to pay too much attention to that. Um, the dots represent high schools. They're sort of fewer dots than you would expect because we binned high schools to make these graphs just a little more sort of readable. Um, so if we go to this top left graph, oops, sorry about that. If we go to this top left graph over here, um, we can see that there's a positive relationship between the effectiveness of the school when attends um, and the likelihood of completing high school. So that is attending an effective uh, school in ninth grade increases a student's odds of high school graduation and the difference in likelihood of graduation between a school at the median, that's at the zero point right here, 74%, and a school at two standard deviations above the median, um, about 78% is about four percentage points. Um, so remember these are historical data and cover students who attended ninth grade um, in 2011, actually through 2015 for this particular graph. Um, so the graduation in our data was, uh, the graduation rate in our data um, in CPS was about 74%, but of course average graduation rates have improved a bit now for students who are graduating now. The top right graph shows a similarly positive relationship between school effectiveness and educational attainment as measured by college going, um, by attending sort of any college. Again, if we look at the median here, we're at about 53% um, college going rates. This is enrolling in any college uh, for the median school. And if you look at the school that's two standard deviations above the median, you're looking at something like 58%. So about five percentage points difference. The bottom left graph shows that um, attending an effective school matters for social outcomes as well. So things are sort of flipped here, right? Because positive impacts on school-based arrests um, are really reducing school-based arrests. Um, so lower rates of school-based arrests. Um, here we see attending an effective school in ninth grade decreased students' likelihood of being arrested at school and or having an arrest uh, that is reported to the school. Um, I know arrest rates have gone down recently in CPS, but this is still really important if we think about the implications for students of different racial backgrounds. Uh, as we can see here, black boys are arrested at two and a half times the rate of their white counterpoint part. So, you know, 7.2% versus 2.9% over the course of a couple of years there. So while these school effectiveness impacts can seem sort of moderate or even small in size, hundreds of black boys trajectories could be positively influenced over the years by attending a more effective school. So I just wanna take a quick moment here to underscore what we've heard so far. Um, first, attending a more effective high school, one that improves self-reported socio-emotional development, test scores and behaviors in ninth grade leads to these really positive longer run outcomes and success for students. And second, um, I want to underscore something John said a moment ago as well, right? The largest component in the school effectiveness index is actually socio-emotional development. So what students report about themselves um, and their socio-emotional experiences receives the most weight in the index. And in turn, um, this really means that schools that foster socio-emotional development are having a tremendous impact on students' longer run outcomes and success. So, so far we showed you sort of the average effect. Uh, but what about heterogeneity or variation across students? Who really benefits from attending the most effective schools or do all or most students benefit? So to examine this question, we assessed uh, how much the positive impacts of attending an effective school vary by the educational advantage of students, uh, which I'm gonna define, define for you right now. Um, we created a metric for assessing educational advantage Basically, we predicted students' educational attainment based on their status on a number of measures in eighth grade. We then constructed an education advantage likelihood scale based on four rank ordered levels of educational attainment, um, completing some high school, high school completion, uh, enrollment at a two-year college, and then enrollment at a four-year college. 
We then combine them mathematically. Um, again, like uh, John, I'm not gonna sort of get bogged down in the details of that, but happy to discuss that either then, or you can check out the technical details in our papers. Um, and so we came up sort of with this scale and I wanna give you a sense of what this scale is. Um, at the, as we divide it into deciles, so these are each 10% of students, um, at the top of educational advantage and the 10th decile, those students are much more likely to graduate high school and go on to four-year college. So they graduate high school at about 90% uh, 90 sort of rate. Um, and um, about 70% of those students go on to go to sort of a four-year college. Um, and then for the least educationally advantaged, this is the um, first decile, 10% of students again, um, about 40% of students graduate from high school and um, as few as 8% went on to uh, attend four-year college. Students in the top decile are more likely to be girls or women. Uh, they're less likely to receive special education services and are far more likely um, to be from a more socioeconomically advantaged family background. So less likely to receive free or reduced price lunch. Um, the top decile also has more Asian and white students compared with um, um, the bottom decile. And the same thing, they have um, fewer brown and black students. So just wanna take a moment here to say that we focus on educational advantage because um, as John said, you know, prior research has suggested that it matters for determining the impacts of high schools, but there's really no consensus on how. Some studies find that educationally advantaged students benefit the most from opportunities because they're sort of more academically ready. Um, well, other studies have concluded that students who are most disadvantaged educationally have uh, more room to grow and may, may be best sort of poised to gain um, for more effective schools. So largely we found support for the latter, um, that more effective schools have greater impacts for educationally disadvantaged students. Uh, I'm going to walk you through these graphs, which show the relationship between school effectiveness on the one hand um, and students' outcomes sort of across uh, different levels of educational advantage. Um, so on the y-axis here is the impact of attending an effective school. Um, again, that's a school that's one standard deviation above the median. And on the x-axis are just those deciles I showed you a moment ago, those deciles of educational advantage. Um, so for, in other words, on these graphs, um, you know, the impact of attending a more effective school is plotted at each decile of educational advantage. So let's just take the left-hand graph at first. For high school graduation, uh, the impact of attending a more effective school tends to be greater for the most educationally disadvantaged students. Um, this red line is just the, the um, I should have mentioned, this is sort of the average that we've already shown to you, the average impact. So for those in the bottom decile of educational advantage, attending a more effective um, uh, school results in sort of a 0 0.03 standard deviation change in graduating from high school. That's about three percentage points. Um, whereas the effect is sort of close to zero for those in the, um, you know, the highest ranks of education advantage. Um, it's possible that this sort of disparate impact may be due in part to sort of differences. I just, I just told you this. Um, there are large differences in the overall likelihoods of graduating from high school for students in the lowest versus the highest deciles. So let's turn to school-based arrests. Um, we find that among, again, this is reversed just like those other graphs, right? So this is reducing school-based arrests and then it sort of approaches zero as you get over towards the highest levels of education um, advantage. Um, so we find that among students in the bottom decile, attending a more effective school decreases school-based arrest by 2.1 percentage points compared to about 0.1 percentage points in the top decile. Um, again, this could be because, this is really likely because this is a relatively rare outcome, being arrested in school is a rare outcome for those in the top, um, at the top of the education advantage distribution. Again, I just want to underscore that it's really worth noting that the effect for um, um, that even small impacts contribute to sort of um, important positive longer run benefits, uh, given the, the potential for sort of residual consequences uh, over the lifetime of being arrested even once. And I also just want to want to flag and sort of point out here that this effect looks really, really small, but it's actually still statistically significant. So even that small impact um, could have uh, longer uh, positive downstream consequences. 
Okay, so I just showed you that for some outcomes, attending an effective school or a more effective school matters for the most educationally matters most for the most um, most educationally disadvantaged students. Um, but but all students actually benefit from attending more effective schools. Uh, so we can see the impact of school effectiveness on four year college going on the left here, and we can actually see that at the first decile and the 10th decile, those are roughly equivalent effects, right? And so it's about a one and a half percent um, percentage point difference in college enrollment um, from attending a school at the median of school effectiveness relative to a school um, at, the, at about one standard deviation above the median of school effectiveness. We can also see here that the peak is actually somewhere in the fifth decile and that essentially, right, nothing is sort of approaching zero. zero. So all students benefit um, from attending a, a four year, um, attending a, a, an effective school, at least in terms of um, the outcome that we're looking at here, uh, enrolling in four year college. So if we turn to persisting in college on the right, um, it actually kind of shows if you just compare the top decile to the bottom decile, it looks like the most educationally advantaged students benefit the most. But again, if you take a closer look here, you see that um, the, the largest impacts are still kind of concentrated. I'm hoping you can see this pointer. <laughs> uh, but the uh, largest benefits um, are actually still concentrated in the, the lower decile. So below the fifth or you know, at the fifth decile and lower um, of educational um, advantage. So the final thing I want to show you is how school climate is related to school effectiveness. So that is how do more and less effective schools look different? So we use the five essentials as our measure of school climate. And as a reminder, the five essentials are derived from an annual survey given to CPS teachers and students. Um, and the five essentials include um, the effectiveness of leaders, the quality and degree of teacher collaboration, um, supportiveness of the environment, as well as the rigor of instruction and involvement of families. Um, based on past work at the consortium, the broad pool of literature on school climate, and that the five essentials um, ratings are publicly available, uh, we thought it made sense to take a look at whether the five E's and you know, the, the school climate uh, were really related to school effectiveness. So um, really understanding though the relationship between high school climate and high school's causal impacts on students' outcomes is important for a number of reasons. Um, so first there's sort of a paucity or like a dearth of evidence on how effective schools differ from less effective ones. And understanding the role of school climate is really just an important sort of first step in that. Um, additionally, sort of districts and states, you know, increasingly include school climate in their accountability metrics um, and state report cards, which can guide hiring and budget decisions, for example. Parents and teachers may also evaluate schools, at least in part based on their climate. Um, and many prominent uh, education organizations, um, the Institutes for um, Institute for Educational Sciences, the US Department of Education, the Department of Justice, have all significantly invested in or provided guidance on um, or sort of otherwise endorsed or supported climate improvement reform efforts. So what did we find? Uh, we found that school climate as measured by the five E's is strongly and positively related to school effectiveness. Again, school effectiveness is the causal impact on those four dimensions of student growth, right? Test score, socio-emotional development um, and behaviors, um, pro-academic behaviors. Um, so here we plot effectiveness on the y-axis, so keep you on your toes here, and then the five essentials on the x-axis. Um, each of these dots is really a high school this time. Um, and you see a nice, clear, sort of positive relationship displayed, um, which just says that as school climate improves or gets better, so too does school effectiveness. I think this is my last graph. Um, so uh, the next thing we did is just identify other publicly available information about schools uh, and tested the degree to which information, um, to which that information is associated with school effectiveness. Uh, specifically, we examined how well demographics, school quality rating, um, and average school level, or I should say ninth grade level uh, math and ELA test scores predicted school effectiveness. How well are they correlated with it? How well do they explain um, the variation in school effectiveness that we see across CPS schools? So we compared the magnitude of those relationships 
with the magnitude of the relationship I just showed you a moment ago between school climate or five E's um, and school effectiveness. Uh, so there are a few key takeaways here. One is just that the five E's explain almost 50% in the variation of school effectiveness. And that's substantially more um, than demographics, which John already showed you are unrelated to school effectiveness, also more than school quality rating, also more than the combined explained variation of um, demographics, school quality rating, and average ninth grade test scores. Uh, another thing I would point out here is that um, school climate, so this is sort of a horse race, which one sort of explains the most variation. Um, but another important thing is that school climate uniquely adds um, sort of explanatory power uh, to these other factors. So even having demographic school rating and test scores, if you add in school climate, you end up with this bar over here. Um, so it, it adds an additional explanation of about 25 percentage points. So here's what I think we should take away from this work. One is that schools that promote student growth on multiple dimensions um, support students' longer run student success. Uh, this suggests um, a more holistic a need for like sort of a more holistic view of children, but also schools. I use children and students a little bit interchangeably on this slide. Um, the second thing I would say here is really focus on student experience, right? students and educators are valid reporters of their own experiences and we know that socio-emotional development those self-reports um, uh, did sort of were driving some of these effects right they were given the most weight in the school effectiveness index so schools that fostered socio-emotional development or foster these more positive self-reports actually um, had the largest impacts on students longer run success Another takeaway is that all students benefit from attending effective schools, um, and in many cases, less educationally advantaged students benefit the most from attending these schools. But again, all students benefit. Important to think about what the outcomes are here. Um, and finally, effective high schools have stronger climates and are better organized, right, have better 5Es than less effective high schools. So lots of prior research has looked at correlations between ninth grade student outcomes and school climate, uh, whereas ours looked at um, the relationship um, between um, school impacts on ninth grade outcomes and school climate. Um, so school causal impacts on ninth grade outcomes and school climate, but we find the same thing, right? This research, in other words, builds on the evidence that cultures, norms, and policies are important factors in shaping students' experiences and later outcomes. So with that, I just wanna say thank you again. Um, I don't know, because I can't see the chat right now, but I would love uh, if we could just pop in these papers if you are interested in sort of the technical details or some of the other analyses we conducted. Um, and also just wanna note that a consortium report is forthcoming. Reading a report is different than hearing people present it. And um, <laughs> I've, I've, I've read your report, but it, I, I just take it in, in in a different way with, uh, you know, hearing it, hearing it directly from you. Um, so we have some questions in the chat, and I, I wanted to, um, uh, you know, kind of, I'm going to try to get to some of those while also trying to tackle kind of some of the, some of the bigger issues that I think you are grappling with. One of the things I really appreciate about this report is you're grappling here with, with some of like the biggest, you know, sort of questions, John, to your, your opening slide that, that we have in education. Um, so I, I, I wonder for, to start off with, um, if, if you could talk a little bit about effect size. Um, I think there are some people who are listening who might say, you know, I, in our heads, we sometimes think about an effective school, we would want to see, you know, huge, greater 10%, 15% growth in high school graduation or decrease in arrests or, or things like that. What can you say a little bit more and maybe put the effect sizes that you found into context with other educational um, education research? Uh, sorry about that. That's I could tell by the look on her eyes. She's looking for me to answer that. So you know. Uh, in terms of um, 
large scale studies like this, you have to realize that a, what, what looks like a small reduction or a small increase is impacting thousands and thousands of kids. So uh, an in, increase of one and a half percent graduation rate across all of these kids is a lot of kids. And even the arrests, which are relatively rare, the average is about 4.4%, um, I think, across both, across gender and race. Um, reducing that is like saving kids' lives, Alex. So um, you often need to think about effect sizes. Your question technically wasn't effect size question. But uh, in terms of the, the size uh, and the breadth of, this isn't an intervention, but, but the, the factors that we've been looking at. Uh, Matt Kraft has a great paper, an educational researcher about this, about um, how when you've got a little small study that's an intensive intervention with a few kids and you're trying different things, you, you expect a big effect size because it's so small scale. But we're talking about the experience over a year of 150,000 kids. So what this 1% here and 2% there, um, it's big, it's really big. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add to that is, um, I would again point to kind of those heterogeneity kinds of things, right? That in some cases there are quite small um, effects for some groups of students, but actually much larger for other groups of students. So it's important to think about um, not just what is the average effect, which can start to kind of um, you know, even out across those things, but also to think about how that effect differs across educational advantage. Um, I would say that. And then the other thing is that we're talking about, and I just want to underscore something John said, we're talking about the regular practices of schools. So we're not trying, we're, we capture the distribution of things that are happening in CPS as opposed to an acute intervention or something like that, right? So we're talking about what is the impact of um, sending someone to a school where they actually say more positive things about their belonging and then we actually only look at a handful of outcomes, but if you look at all the variety of ways um, that is sort of holistically influencing students, I would again sort of think about like, is this a bigger or a small impact, right? If we're getting kids um, experiencing their, their schools in completely different ways um, than um, students attending another school, relatively similar student, right? Attending just a different school. Uh, and then that actually having an impact on whether they go to four-year college, right? And so, Potentially, we can't say for sure, but like potentially, um, it's just the climates that schools are creating, right? And I would love to dig in more to think about like, what are the policies there? What are the practices um, of teachers and educators within those buildings? Um, so I think there's there's a lot to be understood about, about how do we understand the size of this impact? Can I, can I go even a little further with a four-year college uh, going? If you remember the graph, it looks sort of like this. It's not exactly a U, it's actually more like a V where the biggest advantage comes from the kids in the middle of the effectiveness um, index. And those are probably kids who wouldn't otherwise have gone to a four-year college. We know they aren't. So we're getting a kids there in the middle of the spectrum who are being helped a lot by attending effective college, uh, high school going to four-year colleges. We're still seeing benefits at the other end, but the other ends are, um, either very likely to go or very not likely to go, but still getting some advantage from the effective high school. That's right. And so right. like, uh, I, you know, one other way to think about that is like, what if every kid was going to an effective school? Would we uh -huh. still be calling this uh -huh. a small impact? Uh -huh. um, you, there are a couple of questions in the chat about um, sort of the, the implications of your findings and your research for data use. And I wanna call out kind of two, um, two types of data use that people talk about. Um, one is um, there are a few questions about, well, you know, is this the type of data at an individual school level that could help a school um, understand sort of where they are relative to other schools, understand um, the degree to which their actions are in, you know, supporting or not supporting um, different types of their students or different groups of their students. Um, and there's another set of questions in here, as I am sure you can imagine, 
around um, whether or not the some of the the data that, that you analyze here could be used in a different way for uh, accountability um, for rethinking what you know the ways in which we hold schools accountable so i'm wondering if you could talk both about um, the implications here for sort of data use for improvement and for data use for uh, accountability. Well, so can I, can I start with one? And it goes back to a, when I read up off, off a bunch of survey items. I didn't read belongingness, but let's talk, talk about belongingness. You know, I think the 5E survey can give a school a hint of um, whether things look good or don't look good. And the last thing in the world I would want is to have them priming kids on the questions that are on the survey. But I would love to have them have focus group with kids and say, you know, why do you feel so good about being at school? Why do, why do people recognize you? Why do teachers uh, say you're doing good work? Uh, how can we build on that? But I much prefer the sort of qualitative ways of, of um, you know, I'm a big believer in the people who are running their schools know what they're doing, they're smart people. <laughs> they, get pre they get bad pressure to do bad things. So let's rethink, well, how can we use this in a productive, salutary way to help uh, our kids, if we, if we think belongingness is low, what should we do about it? Ask the kids, um, um, build some sort of new routines around it. So I think that's the kind of data uh, use that I think can be gotten from this. Uh, you know, I'm not big on taking this stuff and trying to fiddle with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I would just, I would add that in some ways you have the data, right? What I showed you was a very strong correlation between five essentials and school effectiveness, right? And so part of what that means, I think, is that um, you have a lot of information um, already in collected data data that schools use for school improvement. Um, I think there are lots of other questions you can ask. I love the idea um, of what John is saying here about how do you actually involve student voice, parent voice, community voice as you're thinking about how can you actually shape your school and using this as a um, piece of evidence that it matters how young people feel within their school. Um, and then what you do with that um, uh, you might then turn to, um, you know, folks in the community, parents and, and students um, to help you think about. Um, but I would also just add that you have 5E data and that 5E data, right, tells you something about how young people are experiencing their buildings already um, and places where you could potentially improve. Now, can I add to that? So, you know, just to make sure we got the, our train of thought here, you know, we're, we're establishing that schools that improve these value adds on test score behavior, but especially on the social well being and the work hard, have these causal impacts on student outcomes. So I think that's kind of one where one place to start is how do we um, develop, help, ki help kids develop in these ways? But then the other end of the story is telling us. Well, it's easiest to do that. Schools that have strong climates, um, where there's a su supportive learning environment for kids, where there's rigorous, ambitious instruction for kids, and where everything else suggests that the school is well organized. The one case we have this sort of causal link between the SED measures, graduating, college, not getting tested, but we also know that it's that strong climate that makes it easier for those things to happen. Um, there's a question here about, um, you know, ninth grade and, and why you went, you know, sort of both two things on a technical end, kind of how you, did you look at change from eighth grade to ninth grade? Was it, um, so it, it sounds like the answer is yes, maybe you could say a little more about that. But why, uh, why did you look at, at ninth grade? I imagine this goes back a little bit to some of the, um, you know, to John, some of your previous work, but, but curious about your, your thought process about, about that, that choice. So I can start, I mean, there's lots of reasons. I think you named some, right? We know 
uh, that what happens in ninth grade from lots of consortium work um, matters quite a bit for longer run outcomes, right? And then there's also the potential that students continue to grow, um, affects sort of snowball within ninth grade, but even just using ninth grade alone without knowing the particular sort of mechanisms that lead to longer run outcomes, we know um, that the grade students achieve, um, you know, receive in ninth grade or earn in ninth grade, um, you know, how, um, whether they're suspended and how often, all of these things are really predictive, really impactful for their longer run outcomes. So if we're looking at an indicator, we look at ninth grade to see where students sort of um, end up later. I think another reason is that we see these big shifts for young people between eighth and ninth grade, right? Grades on average drop, test scores um, frequent, sometimes go down. Obviously the behavioral component is one, the like, attendance goes down on average um, and uh, suspensions and disciplina uh, disciplinary incidents go up. So it seems like this sort of like really key transitional moment um, that we'd really like to sort of capture and be able to understand and think about where can schools sort of pick up, bridge across eighth grade and ninth grade um, to actually sort of like reduce or eliminate those sort of um, negative outcomes that happen that seem to change between eighth grade and ninth grade. Do you have anything to add to that, John? Uh, no, I think you really hit it. And All right. well, I'll just one more. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we know that <laughs> transi transitions are hard for everybody, every transition. We know this uh, when kids change schools and the mobility uh, is hard. We know this from all sorts of studies. And every, every transition is difficult. So um, Jeanette's interest in adolescent development, um, if we can identify these key points and these, and, and, and in this case, I look at it as a key opportunity. Yeah. Um, we, we know that um, with a different mindset, high schools really uh, think about freshmen differently and thinking mm -hmm. like, Yes, we can turn these children around. These kids who look like they're in trouble, these vulnerable kids who look, who aren't looking good, we can help them. And I I would love to see this research kind of grow on that and uh, help people to think about that also. Yeah, I would love to see it also sort of bridged with um, you know some of the psychological and neuroscience research. Really, just yeah, to your point, kind of John, thinking about how formative this stage is for young people. Obviously there's lots of variation in what young people are experiencing in ninth grade and at this age, but this adolescent stage is one where you are kind of figuring out who you are, right? How do you belong, really, really attuned to your environment, uh, right? And really thinking about how you fit into it or not. Um, and so for that reason, it's another sort of key stage where you might be thinking about, right, these like structural supports in the school climate and how it relates to what young people are saying about themselves um, and how those sort of that identity formation that's happening there, you're starting to develop independence, um, is really being uh, influenced at that moment. So Jeanette mentioned identity formation, uh, and I'm not a psychologist, and I don't want to get my terms right, but I do believe that some of these um, concepts that we've captured through measurement that go into the, uh, the effect of this indicator. You know, they're, they're broader issues. Uh, uh, Jeanette um, mentioned identity formation, but there are other ideas like gaining a sense of agency, oh. a, a sense of um, you know who you are as a person, identity. Uh, and I think this is just sort of um, on the edges of those bigger, uh, bigger yeah. ideas. Yeah, yeah, more more needed, and really probably some good synthesis work, and us just being in dialogue with with other people um, who are thinking about this stage. Um, so yeah, so not just us, but the research generally. <laughs> um, I want to I want to bring the research into um, obviously this research was done on um, you know cohorts several years back, but I I, I want to bring it to the degree we can kind of into the present day and into, you know, this, this moment. And, um, you know, I, in particular right now, I, I think there are a lot of high school principals around the city who are beginning to think about like, what does it mean to welcome freshmen back? Uh, what would it mean to welcome freshmen back to, uh, to their schools? Um, and what will it mean to welcome freshmen back in September? Um, and, 
I know that at the at the district at the central office level, CPS, I believe it's you know something like 1.8 billion dollars in in the most recent um, uh, you know sort of the the, the stimulus bill. Um, and central office is thinking a lot like how, what should we be spending this money on? Like what should we be prioritizing? Um, as we think about supporting schools over the next six months. And so I'm, I'm curious if you could talk to the degree you can a little bit about kind of the implications your, your findings have both for the, the work of an individual school, high school over the next six months, but also a, a sort of big system in central office. So I wanna just say kind of one thing here, John, then I'll turn it to you. One thing is that what I would like to see is, um, us thinking about things in concert and as a collection of things. And so one of the things that I, at the risk of saying something like mildly controversial, uh, that I get a little worried about is when we're talking about kind of learning over here and socio-emotional development over here, right? And school climate over here. Instead, if we could think about these things um, as all being related to each other um, and in meaningful ways, right? And so in particular, I think about, um, you know, after students return, and I think there's lots to say here. So I don't, I like, I don't want to be like sound flipping here. I think there are many, many things to think about here. I want to just focus on kind of one of them, um, which is that if we are thinking about student learning, we are thinking about socio-emotional development. We're thinking about the social aspects. We're thinking about um, the fact that students have been out of school for the last year um, in a major, you know, during a major pandemic, they've been socialized completely differently. Um, they've missed opportunities to be with their peers. We know there's such a powerful impact of learning with peers. Um, so there's the social aspects, but there's also the academic aspects of that. Um, and there's also been like, depending on how you're situated as a young person, um, there have been these civil uprisings, right? Against racial injustice. And so as a student, you're contending with all of these things. Um, and when you come back to school, I think one of the things that's going to be important to think about, both on the sort of local or independent school or individual school level, as well as like the district and even higher sort of level of policy, is thinking about how is that connected um, to the experience of learning? What are the conditions um, we need to create in schools to um, contend with sort of what's happened over the last years and really be responsive to students culturally, responsive to what kinds of traumas they've experienced and responsive to their socio-emotional development. Um, because I think that would be very productive um, for their experience as learners. And now I'm getting a little worried because I think Alex might've been kicked off the webinar, uh, but I'll turn it to you, John, to see if you have anything. To I, add. Can't, I can't add much at all to, to that, Jeanette. That was great. Um, but I'm just gonna emphasize this idea of integrating that these are not separate things going on. These kinds of developments, whether it's development of content knowledge, uh, development of the way of thinking, uh, critical thinking, uh, they are interwoven with what we're talking about here when we're talking about social emotional development, and they each enhance the other. We 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 believe. I don't think we've proven it in the study by any means, but um, what we have found corroborates that definitely. So That's thinking good. of any time that we're any kind of academic work, think about how, how to interweave the SED into it and the, and the other way around. So there's been a lot of news lately about um, the value of uh, tutoring and can, how it can be made cost effective even with um, one adult and four students. So, it, so I'm sure lots of people are gonna to turn to tutoring um, in the fall. I would say just be mindful of don't just keep it strict. You know, don't just say we're going to drill math skills. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're going to develop relationships and we're going to teach each other how to become yeah. better learners. Yeah, and if we could just circle back to something you said earlier, John, like it's student voice and how are students sort of actively engaged um, in shaping what their school experience will be when they come back to buildings or when they come back to school um, in the fall. And so particularly as you think about things John has said here around student, young people, um, so I'm gonna think about ninth grade here, uh, but you know, developing sort of agency, how are they influential? How are we being careful to um, regard students um, and ensure that they feel valued Right, and I think this is especially important again if we can talk about how kind of racialized these contexts can be. So very important to think about not just this generally, but specifically 
um, you know, related to which students do you have in your building and how can you be responsive to them? Well, that's a great note to end on. Um, I, I, everyone can't clap uh, uh, who's, who's here, but, but I think they, uh, they are right now. And I um, uh, just wanna send a big thank you to both of you, both for, for doing this really, really important work that I think raises um, just important provocative questions about the way that we, or what we focus on with schools, but also for joining us here today and uh, uh, engaging in, in questions about, about this report and sharing it with us more broadly. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us. Thanks for having us.